How you guys doing? 175 people on. We got some things that are going to happen here on Yingling Post Game Live from the press box at Memorial Stadium. I am Gabe DeArmon, the publisher of PowerMizzou.com. I am in the visiting AD suite where there was a little bit more joy than there probably should have been at times tonight. Missouri beats Middle Tennessee State 23-19 to to move to 2-0 on the season. Before we get into it and take your comments, and, and there's already a bunch, please add your comments, your questions. We will address it all. Be here somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes. Break it all down. But before we get to that, look, if you guys haven't done it, I have a feeling a lot of you are a couple adult beverages deep. We hope that that is a yingling lager. Maybe if you are trying to watch your calories, maybe you got a, a figure you need to protect, grab a yingling flight, whatever you do. Pop open a Yingling, hang out with us for a little while, and uh, we're going to have a little fun. And I got a man who's going to have a little fun here. So <laughs> on, I don't know, Wednesday, I think it was, Gerard Hamilton picked Missouri to win this game 20-17. to 17. And he took his beating for about 72 hours. And Gerard... You talk your talk, man. The stage is yours. I mean, well, I've been telling—I was telling Gabe all day. Better not be close. It, it, it just—it better not be close for three. It better not be a three or four point game or none of that. And they needed to start off better offensively. Yeah, I took my beating, twenty to seventeen. I made that pick to a gold medal earlier in the week. He—I even had a question like, was the twenty and a half spread? You know, is that too much? And I said for sure. For sure, that's too much because I've been watching the same team like everybody else. I'm not doing anything different. But so, well, obviously, I'm doing the work. I, re I research on MTSU and what they did well and all that good stuff. I will say that. But as far as the Tigers that we're all watching, I told you guys they have lows on offense. Sometimes their defense gets in a – you know, they have a possession or two where you're just like, eh, and the other team goes up the field even though they weren't – you know, they probably shouldn't have. Um, then there's things you can't account for. Missed PATs, back-to-back penal -back penalties on that on that last drop, just things like that. Where when you're predicting and you're saying, "Oh, it's Mizzou versus a G5," and look at look at their uniforms and their decal and stuff like that, Missouri's going to handle them. I was thinking, well, we've been through this before. We went through it last week. We went through it many times in their wins last year versus teams like Vandy and Arkansas. So I'm not going to go too hard on y'all because I know I got to be the logical one. This is why Gabe brought me in. I'm not. I'm going to I'm going to be fair and I'm not going to do any favoritism at all. I'm going to predict what I think is going to happen. And this made sense to me. I'm not really shocked by, you know, what happened here tonight. And I want to be clear. And, and Jeremy, thanks, man, for, for the donation. Appreciate all you guys being here. We got 321 people on and it's 1030 on a Saturday night. We do appreciate that. Want to want to make sure we recognize uh, producer Alex Stenman behind the scenes. He's handling all your comments and questions, getting up the graphics and and doing all that so we can just talk. And uh, look, I want to be clear. Like. It was important that that uh, that that Gerard got his his little. Uh, I don't want to even call it a victory lap, but but like I want to be clear, this is not the game we were rooting for. We would yeah, love it to come on here, and Missouri had won this thing 51-10, and you guys are happy, and you guys are talking about, oh, K-State, K-State might not want this next week. Well, that's not how you guys are talking, and we wish it was. It would be better for all involved. Um, it was very obvious at halftime that that was not what we were going to see. Now, I will say this. Missouri was up, what, 17-10, something like that. And then there 16. was a point. He missed the PAT. Right, 16-10. But there was a point where you thought, like there was a point where I thought my prediction was going to be right. I picked this game 30-9. to They went up 23-10, and I thought, all right, they're going to get another stop. They're going to get a garbage score. And like 30 to 10, I'm going to be pretty close here. Here has been my issue with this team for a year and a half. It's not just that they can't close something out. It's that they appear to get in the, a situation in the second half of games and not just go 
is it possible to screw this up? But mm -hmm. what's the absolute worst possible thing we can do here? Yep. First of all, they go up 16-10, they miss a PAT. Then they're up 23-10. Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember how middle. Or, no, I'm sorry. They're up 23-17. Yeah, they, they're, no, 20, they're, they're, 20. Up they're up 23-10, and they punt the ball on fourth and one yep. from the 45-yard line of Middle Tennessee. And I'm going to write a whole column about that. I, Eli Drinkwood said he thinks it's the right call every time. I don't. That's fine. He can think that. I can think what I think. We disagree. They punt the ball, 83-yard drive, 23-17. So what's the, like, even at that point, if you go three and out and punt, like, it's not great, but it's better than what Missouri did, which is Brady Cook gets outside the pocket, hangs onto the ball too long, hit, fumbles out of the end zone, safety, 23-19. Then they get the ball back. They get to third and a foot, and they have back-to-back -back penalties to put themselves in third and 21. It's like, it's not only that they don't make it easy. It's like they're almost intentionally saying, how can we make this as hard as possible? Sabotaging themselves. That's all it is. It's, it's. I mean, the last 10 minutes, because there was a point where you was telling me uh, it was 23 to 10, and I can't remember exactly. It may have been that possession before, you know, you know, a couple plays before they punt, and you was just saying, to me like, I don't know, Gerard, if they score, you know, Maybe, you know, stuff much prediction, but I was saying that even if they did score, Missouri ended up winning 35 to 10. The re the fact that it took them into the fourth quarter to get to 23 versus MTSU, like I knew MTSU was better than, you know, their performance at Alabama and stuff like that, but it shouldn't have been like this. I mean, to me, the offense early on, they were blitzing uh, MCSU sending the house, five guys, six guys. And, you know, they even got in there a couple of times with four guys. Why were they trying to throw? Why was Missouri trying to still throw the ball deep when the move is to make the, the short game, the quick passes? I mean, drink talked about this in his presser, you know, to start the week. Why? I just, there's some things I don't get, but anyway, back to the end of the game, it was, that was terrible. Like, they tried to lose that pass interference. I asked Theo Weiss about it. I said, what happened on the pass interference? Yeah. He said, he goes, he I said, didn't see it. He said, he said I, didn't, I didn't even see. I was looking for the ball. So, which means to tell me he didn't even feel what the penalty was for. If you got interfered with, you know it. Yeah, you know you're, uh, he grabbed me. I felt this and that. No, he was like. It's the opposite of uh, James Bradbury in the in the Super Bowl, where James Bradbury is like, "Yeah, I, I held him." Right. Theo Weiss is like, mm, "I mean, it was a penalty, but I didn't, I didn't see I, it. I don't know why." Yeah. So knowing you got bailed out in a game like this, I mean, that's and, that's not good. It's not good. And look, I do want to be clear. It does need to be said that call I think was a makeup call. And Bradley points it out. The P.I. call on Luther Burt. Missouri had the first down mm -hmm. on the previous play. And they were called for off. Luther Burton was called for offensive pass interference. Drink said after the game, he's got to watch it on film. But he thinks it was like an anticipation call. He said the touchdown to Theo Weiss was actually the exact same play. They were in the mm -hmm. exact same play and didn't get called for P.I. there. Did get so. So to be fair, that yes, I think that pass interference was a bailout call. But I think it, they were only in position to be bailed out because I think the refs probably made a bad call before that. Uh, you know, so, but again, it just, it shouldn't have been this hard. It, 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 two straight weeks, you came here and you wanted to see a sign. You wanted a reason to feel good with Kansas State coming here. Mm -hmm. And you haven't gotten it. I, I mean, you just haven't gotten it. And this is this is the other thing. There was a lot of there was a lot of people upset about 35 to 10 against South Dakota last week. And and you know what? Rightfully so. I was pretty hard on them after that game. And then what you get is you get a lot of pushback of, well, they won 35-10 and it should have been 41-10. What do you do? Like you're just complaining, just no, there were visible problems in that game that gave you reason to pause. And now there are more of them that give you reason to pause going for And now look, here's the beauty of college football. I don't know. Missouri might come out next week and beat Kansas state by 17 points. Like it, it's certainly possible. Weird crap happens in this sport every single week. So 
that's not off the table. This is not guaranteed three and nine team, any of that stuff. But all we can judge them on is the evidence they have presented so far. And the evidence they have presented so far shows me not one thing that this team can win eight football games this year. This game or this team is too much like last year. I wrote about it last week. I mean, it's the defense. And, and, and this is from the guy who was laughing at me for at halftime writing. I feel like we sit down and watch, watch reruns every week. <laughs> oh, that no, that song, was just man. a fun, that was just a that was just a funny line that that had me dying. <laughs> but but yeah, this is this is the same team as last year. They don't move the ball down the field well. They rely too much on their defense to bail them out. I mean, there was a lot of problems. I mean, uh, MCSU nine of eighteen on third down two of three on fourth down. So that means for the season, teams are four of six on uh, fourth down versus Missouri. But you can't – like even Drink wasn't focused on that because I felt like I asked him about that. And his first thing was, well, to start the game, they shut MTSU out in the first quarter. Um, mm -hmm. And they struggled to score points and stuff like that. And the offense couldn't give them no, so no support. And I told mm -hmm. Gabe, that's like when a pitcher has a really good game and he doesn't get no run support. Like how – eventually plays like possessions, like how they got to 17 points. That's how that stuff happens. When the offense can't do anything for you, they can't move the ball, the coach wants to, you know, plan on fourth and short and stuff stuff like that. The, the defense is good, but, I mean, you they can only do so much, you know? It, it's like I said to you in the third or the fourth quarter. They are asking this defense to be perfect, and that's not fair. Like the defense, point, by the, way. the defense gave up what uh 286 total yards. I think. Yeah, let me look. I mean, under 300 yeah. yards for the second week in a row. Yeah. They're they're giving up an average of 13. Uh, let's see, 29, and a half. so 14 and a half points a game, and really 13 and a half yeah. because two tonight are straight on the offense, and really less than that because the seven last week came on a 29 yard touchdown drive. Like, I'm not uh, – yeah, Middle Tennessee was 9 of 18 on third down, and some of them were third and long. But, again, I'm not asking you to be perfect. This has been an A-minus defense through two weeks, I think. Yep. And that's yep. good enough. That has to be good enough. But the problem is it's not good enough because it's been a D-plus offense through two games. Yep. You know, it, it just – it's the same thing, and, and uh, all the comments that Alex was just putting up on the screen, 100% right. Like, this is the third straight year we've seen the same damn thing. Yeah. I, they've they've got to fix it. They, there's this, it's as simple as that. They've, they've got to fix it. Um, I don't know. This offense, that's, it's a problem, but it is also a problem. Special teams is a problem. I mean, yeah. somebody asked Drink about the special teams, and he sounded mortified. He's like, no, it's really a concern out yeah. there. I mean, I seen, you know, I don't know how high up we are, but when that PAT, when they tried to uh, do the hold for that, I seen the hold from up here. Now, looking on the TV up here, I was just like, that looks kind of funky, and he ended up missing it. Now, Drink said uh, it got tipped. But he also said the blocking on that play was bad. And what do we keep saying every week? The blocking on these field goals, these PATs, looks wonky. Like mm -hmm. people are getting through. And that's not just on Eric Link, like how people could say last year. That's on Drink. That's on Coach Pogue, uh, the cornerback's coach. That's on Blake Baker. They're all helping him. So they've got to all figure out what's going on there. So uh, along those lines, and and yeah, I was just going to ask Alex to put this up. G Gerard, you are now going to be asked to be uh, everyone's uh, gambling advisor on Power Mizzou after picking this one 20 Well, here's, here's, here's what I told you when we was going down to pressers. I feel like a lot of people, the reason they didn't like my prediction is because the line said minus 20 and a half. Stop, guys. Stop. I know we all want to make some money, but that's not the way you should be thinking about this. Here's, here, here's, what, here's what Gerard's too nice to say. Don't go to Vegas, man. Just call 1-900-GERARD. He'll give you the picks. He'll give you a pick <laughs> every single week. <laughs> but, uh, no, but along those lines, back to the special teams. All right, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you are in the fourth quarter next week. You're trailing Kansas State 20-17. to 17. 
You got fourth and two at the 24-yard line. What are you doing? You letting Mevis try to kick? Well, and I say that, I know what Eli Drinkwitz will do. He'll kick because he doesn't trust his damn offense to go get two yards because he already told us that tonight. I think I think you kick – he's going to kick anyway. And right. maybe because maybe, maybe because they're at home, though, you can kick. You can get the field goal. You feel like that overtime thing. Like, I know a road team in that situation is like, we're going for it automatically. We need to get the win to get out of here. Um, but I don't – it's just hard to even answer. You probably should go for it. But just knowing what we know, he's not going for it on fourth and one from the 45-yard line versus South Dakota and Middle Tennessee. You think versus Kansas State he's going to put it all on the line? Not even, Not even a little bit. Not even and, a man. And look, I, I'm going to write about that. Uh, I'm going to write about that, and I don't want to get too deep into it here because it's my column. But I'm just going to say this, guys. What happened to the dude I watched throw flea flickers at the defending national champions and refuse to call timeouts and trust his defense to hold up on four, down, on four downs inside the five against LSU? I don't know where that guy went, but that guy's not your head coach anymore. I, he he just isn't. And uh, Alex, I'm going to jump in here and throw up a comment because I want to address it real quick. Uh, tobacco saying, waiting for Gabe to say, it's my job to remind you it's never as good or as bad as it seems. I wish I could do that tonight, guys. I really, I, I'd love to tell you. By the way, if anybody out there has two friends, we could get to 500 people watching this show. So that'd be great. Yeah, call up two friends, tell them to come, text them, text them the link. Uh, but I would love to tell you it's not as bad as you think it is right now. And it's probably not as bad as a lot of you think it is. Like Eli Drinkwitz didn't get fired tonight. They're not going 2-10. and 10. They're going to beat somebody else. But it's not good. There, there's nothing. And here's what I will say I respect about Eli Drinkwitz. He didn't try to blow smoke up our ass at his post-game press conference. Now, like, you know, Theo, we said, hey, it's a win, and wins are hard, and we're going to celebrate it. And I don't want to take that away. It, 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 good. You should go celebrate it tonight. But Drinkwood said, look, special team's a big problem. Gerard, you asked him about the offensive line, and, I mean, he gave me oh, boy, he went in on some dudes there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just can't. What sticks up in my mind is I think Cameron Johnson had the first penalty of the night. I can't remember if it was a false start or holding. But with stick that safety where he gets pulverized into the ground instantly off the line, that's what made me ask the question. So I asked Drink, you know, is there some personnel changes we can see? And usually I feel like he would be like, you know, we're going to evaluate and practice. Look at the tape. Yeah, the, you know, run of the mill stuff. But he was like, oh, no, no, there's going to be personnel changes. We're not going to stick to giving up 12 tackles for loss and four sacks. And he didn't say this part, but I know he's thinking it to Middle Tennessee State. We're not going to let them do that and think, oh, let's throw the same five out there. That can't happen. So, so we'll, we'll see some new things going on. You mentioned Cameron Johnson. This is the second straight, straight week Marcellus Johnson has had a pretty costly penalty. He had, yeah. a, he had a hold or a motion last week. He had a motion tonight on third and an inch. Yeah. Um, here was the concerning part to me. Mm -hmm. That entire first half, the pressure was coming from the edges. So oh, yeah. uh, I know on one of them, like Javon Foster, Foster just, just got run around on the first sack by yeah. uh, Brady yeah. Cook. Like these are your best linemen. The, like the yeah. weakness of this line is supposed to be in the middle. They were getting torched on the edge. Yeah, the I seen one or two from Armand, and then like you said, that there's just that one play. I can't remember. Was that there was one sack where we was just like, no, they just got in with four, and I don't know if that was the one on Foster. Um, yeah, but, but I think it was, but there was definitely one where they weren't blitzing. Yeah, they they were having some they were having some pressure come, but I don't know yet. The your best tackles kind of just it, it was a it was a rough night for the offensive line, and it makes you think, which people should have known though, kind of thought about it was still South Dakota. Like it was a promising sign for what they did, and again, they don't feel as bad as last year, but they're not like there is stuff to worry about. Yeah, well, and there. yeah, um, I, I, I lost my train of thought. To be quite honest with you, I don't know what I was going to mm -hmm. say. I think I was probably just going to bitch about something else, honestly. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it, look, guys, it's uh it, it can turn around in a heartbeat. I mean, 
this team can like we could sit here next Saturday at two thirty and be having a completely different conversation than we're having right now, and that that does have to be said. And shout out to you guys, we're up over five hundred. It, it, really awesome. We appreciate it. I know Yingling appreciates it. Um, you know, so so thanks so many of you guys for for hanging out here with us and, and talking about this. And, and we don't take for granted how important this stuff is to you. And that like that's why I. Look, this is year four. It's time to be like you're judged differently now than you were in year two. And we're talking about a situation where the guy he's starting at quarterback, who I know a lot of people say isn't good enough, and that's fine. If All we said is he's got to make the right call. And if he doesn't make the right call, it's going to save him, lose him his job. Well, the guy he's starting at quarterback was recruited by the last head coach. His two starting running backs are transfers because – I, I, I guess the guy he evaluated last year can't get on the field because we haven't seen him in two games. We barely saw him last year. Um, this is the second straight year he's brought in transfers at the offensive line where, frankly, the early returns aren't very promising. Like, Connor Woods started, but a lot of issues. EJ and Doma Ogar can't get on the field. Cameron, Marcellus Johnson isn't starting. Cameron Johnson may not be starting much longer. Um, I don't know, man. Like, that – the evaluate there's just a lot of things that you don't feel very good about right now. Uh, so let's talk about some of the positives for a minute. Cause Jeff Lever is asking and, and Jeff appreciate the donation and, and thank you guys. Uh, again, we never asked for it, but always are happy to get it. Uh, any positives or players that stuck out? Like what was good for you tonight? What, what do you look back at and say, that's something you, you feel good about going forward? Um. I mean Luther, right? I mean Luther, but I don't want to give. I want to do easy ones. I mean, a drink said, you know, that he thinks Theo Wee should get the ball a lot more often. I mean, he made made that touchdown play where he high pointed the ball, mm -hmm. and then he made that play. I think it was a third down. I can't really remember, but it was a big play at the end of the game to kind of seal it. Um, he thinks he should be more of a playmaker. But honestly, let's say the running backs. Cody Schrader didn't have a great night, but Nate Pete had a pretty good night. Uh, 51 rushing yards, and then it was, uh, you know, the 49-yard rushing touchdown. I mean, it wasn't all world or nothing by them, but, like, I felt like, all right, there there was times where it was just like, okay, like, they're doing something. And it's important that they do something because down the stretch, when a game gets close, when it got to 23-17, what did we say to each other? He's going – Drink is going to inside zone the ball to them. Mm -hmm. This whole game, we were seeing them do, you know, stuff to the outside and stuff like that, kind of mixing it up. When it's when it's not cr crunching time, to be honest, it's like he tells them, hey, take the ball and go straight up the middle, just straight up the middle behind the line. And I don't know, but it's good that the running backs, you know, had a good night and because they're going to be getting the ball out. They had 46 uh, touches or rushes or something like that tonight. Yeah. Uh, I thought Niles Gaddy was a positive. Had two yeah. sacks. He yeah. was consistently around. I think uh, Johnny Walker Jr. is a player. Saw Josh yeah. Landry flash. Um, um, Chuck Hicks. Um, Chuck Dale, Hicks and, yeah. Dale and Carnell, I mean, he had a pretty good game. Pull up his stats really. Eight tackles, a sack, two tackles for a loss, a pass break. I mean, he had a really, really good game. And, and, and that pass breakup was 40 yards downfield. You remember, like, we were both – we yeah, both we, had to look twice and go, hang on, is that Carnell covering that dude? Yeah, really, yeah, he, was, yeah, yeah, he was pretty uh, – he was pretty out there down the field. Um, who else was uh, – I, I asked well, D. Roberts about the depth of the team and just – there's a lot of people who can make plays, and you don't have to just rely on one or two people. That's why I think this team – It's too bad all but one or two of them are on the defensive side of the ball. I, I, that's why I said in, in my quick thoughts that they have the potential to be better than 2022 just because you don't – you can have someone like Chuck Hitz play even though Chad Bailey was active, and he still make a really – a pretty good impact from the game. So uh, can we take just a minute to talk about the best player in college football if we're talking about positives? Middle Tennessee has a dude, and I forgot his name, Oh, he's 6'4", 259, and he plays wide receiver. That uh, guy is second to Travis Hunter on my Heisman ballot. I freaking love him. Jeremy Tate Jr. is Jeremy who he's Tate. referring to. And if you were looking at my thoughts throughout the game, I didn't even really call him his name. I just said the Gronk-like guy because he looks like Gronkowski. Oh. He's huge out there. And he looked kind of nimble, though. 
it's not like he was getting the ball and was just stuck. He was he was doing his thing. And what was it, Justin Olsen, who was yep, high running yeah. and, and making all types of catches? Like, um, he, he had a pretty good game too. Yeah, but Justin Olsen, he looks like a wide receiver. Like he's a little yeah, skinny dude. Uh, the other guy, he looks I like still a think receiver. Yeah. That dude looked like a defensive lineman playing wide receiver. And yeah, he was, mad respect yeah. to Jeremy Tate. He's my favorite player in college football. I love that guy. Um, so, I mean, you asked for positive. That's one of my positives, to be quite honest with you. I'm, uh, I'm a big fan. So, um, what, can you? Uh, let me ask you this: Can you? What are the positives? that you could take away from Brady Cook? Because I, I know people have mixed opinions on, on his play today. What are what, what did you see overall today? From I'll say this about Brady. There were a couple times in the second half that they trusted him to throw the football in situations I wasn't sure they would trust him to throw the football. You know, the, the third and six pass to Weiss that ends up getting called mm-hmm. back on the, on the P.I. Like, that's a throw that ultimately really probably should have iced the game. And if you don't believe in your quarterback, like I said, I would not have thrown the ball. I would run the football, make Middle Tennessee use the last timeout, punt it, and make them go 85 yards. Drinkwitz put the game in Brady's hands, and he made the throw. So ultimately, when he came down to it, he did what he had to do. But I also understand the complaints, right? Now, I want to be clear again. I don't think the that like I don't know if Sam Horn was would have changed this game, but I do understand why people wanted to see him, you know, because I didn't think Brady played all that well for a lot of the game. Yeah, I mean his stat line it was like fourteen and nineteen for two hundred something yards and stuff like that. It it was efficient, but that's why this context is so important, guys. I mean there was. At least two or three deep balls where we were just like, ah, that's over. That's underthrown. Because how different is this game if I don't know when it was? It was on the first drive. It was like the third or fourth play from scrimmage. I mean, Luther Burden has a step, step and a half. He's not high school open, but he is open. Yeah. And Brady underthrew him. He just did. And then on the next series, Luther had, I'd say, probably two and a half steps, and Brady led him too much. And I, there was pressure on him, but you're going to have pressure, man. Those are two throws that need to be made. I will say that Drink, when we asked him about Brady's performance, the first thing he did say was, like, there was just kind of, like, too much pressure, basically. Mm-hmm. Like, he thinks Brady does need to play better, obviously. But this offensive line, it's – there's some there's some troubling things about it. So, I feel like that's a little bit telling. Also – I brought up a stat earlier in the week that Brady hasn't had a turnover since week eight versus Vandy last year. He obviously had the safety, but there's plays where he should have had a turnover. There was there was a pick six oh, yeah. the where we all was like, ooh. And that, that was at 16-10, and that yeah, could have given Middle Tennessee the uh, lead. Yeah, there's I remember versus South Carolina, he had a play like that where he threw it up in double coverage and it got intercepted in some – Oh, P.I. kind of washed it away and it doesn't count. But there are still plays where you go, ooh. So he definitely didn't have a, a great night. Um, but it's not all on him. That I just can't keep stop thinking about the offensive line. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. It uh I mean, it look, it's it's the same thing we talked about last year. Outside of Luther Burden, almost nothing on this offense is good enough. It just it just isn't right now. I mean, Brett Norfleet finally caught a pass. They used a tight end. That was cool. I liked that. Um, yeah. He did know, have one through his hands. He did have one he, through his hands. Oh. He was complimentary of uh, of Theo Weiss, so I'll, I'll, I'll assume he knows. You know, the, the numbers weren't eye-popping, but I'll assume he played well. Um, Makai Miller made a catch early. Then, yeah. And I, I hadn't thought of this. We didn't see him much in the last two or three quarters. I wonder if there was something – Health wise, but like it just wasn't on my radar in the post game, so I we didn't ask about it. We'll find out about that in the next few days. Um, you know, but but look, the the offense, like if they're gonna get to seven or eight or whatever you want the number is, it's gonna be like last year, and and I think that's I I wrote this at halftime. I really do think 
like, I don't think Eli is lying to us in the summer. I really think he does want to open it up and he does want to be more explosive and he does want to be more aggressive. And then I think he gets midway into every game and go, well, I can't do it because I just, I just don't have the guys to do it. Yeah, but. At some and that's point, his fault. I'm not removing blame from him for it, but, you know. At some point he's got to, he's got to be able to be willing to try things Especially again, when when is he? The schedule does not get any easier. When will he right. do some of these things that he has a chance to do? They, would we agree they played their two easiest games of the year? Yeah, that's all. I, I they've got Memphis, and I'm not thinking that's easy. I'm I haven't looked at Memphis yet, but I'm feeling the same way about Memphis that I feel about this game. Like they're formidable, I guess. I I don't know about Memphis. And Vandy, like Vandy's not great, but. They're an SEC team. I think they're probably as good or better than Middle Tennessee. And and also, let's put it like this. This team, there is no such thing as gimmies. This is right. – and this goes back to the predictions. Everybody's just assuming things are gimmies because of how those teams play other teams and, and stuff like the Bama effect. And that doesn't matter versus when they're playing Missouri. That has nothing to do with when they're playing Missouri. And it shows. It's a four-point win in – Again, it could have been a lot better, but just a lot of things weren't clicking for him. And this goes back for me to talking about asking your defense to be perfect. I made this analogy so many times during the Conzo Martin era in basketball. I said, when your goal is to win every game 60 to 58, your margin for error is so slim. Like all it takes is a couple bad possessions in basketball and, and you got beat. That's how I feel about this team. Like when, when you're just trying to win every game 20 to 17, like, Guess what happens sometimes, man? Somebody gets crossed up and doesn't cover the other teams running back out of the backfield or a ball slips out of somebody's hands or just all it takes is one play and this game is a loss. And if this game is a loss, like people are already panicking, but like we're we're so far beyond that. If just and, and that's it goes back to I heard so many things at the end of last year. Well, look how close they were to eight and four. But nobody wanted to talk about how close they were to four and eight. Nobody wanted to talk about Vandy and Arkansas being one play from beating them. Yeah. And if you're going to say they were almost eight and four, you have to say they were almost four and eight, right? And that's the margin in a season. Like the difference between four and eight and eight and four is going to be like five plays. And that's it. And when you are trying to win every game in a rock fight, you open yourself up to a stronger possibility that one of those plays goes against you. Yeah, I, I mean, you hit it. You hit it right on right on the head. Uh, they've they've got so much work to do, and I'm looking at the score, but twenty three points. I just, I don't know. It it just feels weird. It just it feels it doesn't feel like what we were thinking in the spring and the off season and everybody just seemed in so such a much more positive mood, like the players and stuff about it being explosive. And if they're going to feel like every team every year feels, you know, better about it, but I feel like everybody there was undefeated team. in May, man. Yeah. Everybody, everybody had a genuine, like, Oh, my role in the offense. I think I can do this, this and that and I can do this, this and this, but that's why the games are played because it's just not that cut and dry that here's the schedule, here's how you're going to win, or here's what you're going to win, and here's what you're going to lose. Jason's asking, has the ceiling been lowered on number of total wins? So we actually had this conversation walking to the postgame press conference. And I think we both are still at seven and five. But in the past, we both said, I think eight is more likely than six. And I think we both now feel six is quite a bit more likely than eight. Like, I've got a hard time seeing this team being good enough to win eight games right now. Yeah, I've always been like seven and five. Oh well, it's been the two games. Let's forget. Uh, we've always said like the Kansas State game is going to be determined how to kind of like quarterbacks play and stuff like this for two games. I think we, they're losing uh, next week if they keep up this performance. And so I was seven and five leaning to eight four right now. I just feel like I'm a, just a straight seven and five. Um, yeah. You know, I, yeah, I think they'll still win seven yeah. games. But it's hard. And look. They've won two games that we both predicted them to win. You and I both picked K-State as a loss. There was a a comment up there just a second ago. I I didn't see who made it, but uh, 
four and six the rest of the way to go bowling. I want to say, first of all, that's true. Second of all, I don't care. That's not the goal. <laughs> that that That's not good enough in year four. And I'm not saying you fire him for it, but I'm not saying you don't. Four, six and six, no. It just no. It's not good enough. It's it's not, and obviously there's got to be some context behind some of these things. Even even the wins, because like last year we could say like first the Auburn game kind of felt fluky. I mean, two plays you just don't think will happen the Kentucky game. But then what if they're doing if they go six and six this year, and you you know let's say Drink's argument is like we went six and six, but then you can kind of point to how you did, but you only beat MTSU by. Or you kind of struggled a little bit with South Dakota more than you needed to, and depending on what other games happened down the line, it looks more like it went four and eight, five and seven, despite if, the, what the record says. If this team goes six and six, in all likelihood, the best win is either Florida or South Carolina. Those teams suck. <laughs> like they just do. <laughs> like you can go six and six and not beat anybody any good. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, let's not pretend Middle Tennessee is a great team. They got run off the field by Alabama last week. And, by the way, like, Alabama's good. But I think we might have seen tonight, Alabama may not quite be Alabama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, but that's why we just got to do things on a game-by-game -game basis because right. I'm, I'm sure Alabama fans thought, oh, well, we just crushed them with Milrow and all that and all these questions we had. I'm feeling confident going into the Texas game and then look what happens there. And then same thing with Mizzou fans tonight, you know, obviously thinking y'all got a good win last week and then MTSU was on the side of a beat down. So you're thinking it's easy. It's, it's why the games are played. Right. And Jeremy and Nick bring up exactly the point I've been making. What does seven and five do for you? I mean, I've said it all along. It's a step forward, but like, I don't think it juices anybody up. And, and I think it's important to know, these fans want to – they want to buy in. They want to believe. There were 57,000 here tonight. Next week sold out. LSU is going to be sold out. So you're talking about three straight home games that are going to be the biggest crowd Eli Drinkwitz is coached in front of. Mm -hmm. Show them something. You want to come back, show them something. Yeah. They mostly – I mean, they're showing up without any real proof that they should show up. You tell them what to wear every week, so they got to go out and buy new shirts to come to every game, and they're doing that. It's time to reward the people who are showing up. Right. And also, one more thing, back to the, the six and six, and Jason asked if, if Mizzou goes six and six, are we talking coaching search in January? It's possible. Again, if they go six and six, and the context is you didn't show nothing on offense, we, we gave you the extra money in the contract extension to get a coordinator and – the offense looks the same or possibly it could be even worse than last year. That also works against him, even if he goes six and six, if you're just you're scoring 23 points per game because you didn't need to hire someone to score 23 points per game. Or you know, So, we'll, hey, look, guys, the truth is we're going to have plenty of time to talk about that. If, if that's where this season ends up, we will have all kinds of time to debate whether that's that's what happens, and we'll do it. Um, you know, so, uh, so I want to – I, I kind of want to finish it up on this. We generally try to go – somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes. So we're coming up on 40. So we got a few more minutes here. We'll, we'll finish up this thought. And then uh, hey, Todd Gessling's asking about Justin Gage. Appreciate the question. Uh, I, I'll throw it out there real quick. He was, he was, uh, he was Hall of Fame inductee, opened the game by banging the drum. Um, Justin was a true two-sport athlete, uh, really gritty piece of some good basketball teams. The first, like, the, the first probably – great player that Pinkle coached um, because Justin Smith was already gone. So glad to see Justin get his due, um, but but kind of want to get back on topic. So this is the last thing I want to – we'll go back and forth a little bit. Then we'll Alex can just kind of hit us with some lightning round comments or questions all the way out the door. Um, so somebody asked Brady Cook about, uh, you know, turning the page to next week and all that. And I appreciated that Brady said – like. There's no doubt in it, man. He said, oh, no, this team really wants this one. This one is very – this is a very, very big week. Um, they know that everybody uh, – trust me, I talked to people inside the program over the summer. 
they knew this was the one. Like, they had to get past the first two. They did. It wasn't as pretty as you wanted to. But they know what this game means. And they know what it means for the season. Yeah. What if what if we beat uh, K State next week? Someone asked. I mean, it's still it's still a possibility, and yeah. the juice that may have kind of went out, you know, went out the last. Well, this game and it's bad. maybe a little bit for South Dakota. Yeah, you got you got that, and now you're feeling confident that you're beating it, a ranked team. If right. I could do like a good mob impression i do the godfather you know just when you thought you were out they pulled you back in that's that's what that's what next week is like you think you're out tonight you guys are out you're you're pounding yingling saying fire him we hate this dude we can't ever win if he wins next week it's going to be back to oh man he got williams winery coming if he could just get wingo we're taking off like that's what yep. fandom is man it is a freaking roller coaster but they could say, well then then they're probably five and oh the lsu and I don't know. Then we're back to kind of where we started in the off season, though. It mm-hmm. just depends on a lot of things. Yeah, but it's – I mean, it's huge. Uh, look, it's played out – the first two weeks haven't gone as well as you wanted to, but it has played out the way we thought it would all off season, right? Okay, they're going to be 2-0, and and now he's coaching the biggest game of his life. And you hope in six weeks it's not the biggest game of his life because other games have gotten bigger. But right now – it's the biggest game he's ever had here, and he knows it, and his team knows it. And it's been a while since there's been a moment like that where Missouri really showed up, right? Like, because we knew the game at K State was pretty big last year, and they were awful. I mean, they were just awful. Um, and and to be honest, Missouri hadn't played very many big games in the last few years because they haven't been good enough to do it, you know. So. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, we'll we'll see. What do I you mean, think of- I mean, look, Gerard, you, you could just tell everybody what the score is going to be. Like, we know you know. Well, here's the here's thing. I, I'm not trying to make it seem like I'm that guy. I'm just saying <laughs> I did the, I did the I'm homework. I'm trying to make it seem that way. I, well, I you know, I know I did the work, but I'm not – I don't want to make it seem like I'm I'm the swami of everything. I, I don't know everything, <laughs> but – um. What do you think that line will be? We talked about this earlier. What do you think the spread will be for that game next week now? I saw a thing last week that said K-State by one, and that didn't make any sense to me. That didn't make sense then. Yep. And now, after seeing this game, like, I would go K-State five and a half, which really means eight and a half, but I'm giving Missouri three points for being at home. I don't know what that is. Um, now nah, I'm kind of around the the eight ish, eight and a half. But I'll say, I'll just say, I'll just say, actually, K State six, because yeah, home and it's gonna be a good environment. I mean, if it can be anything like the Georgia game last year, I mean, how how much of a boost you know that that could be. So I'll say K State six minus six right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's fair. Um. I think there's going to be a decent amount of purple in the stadium next week you know um yeah i, mean, I think I, I think some k-staters are contributing to that sellout probably yeah i, I seen the the fans kind of getting into it already uh you know the last couple of days you know since they announced the sellout and so it's it's going to be crazy and gabe the best thing is it's an 11 a.m game right it is an 11 a.m. game. Oh, man. That's so, going to be. So, you know, the one thing I can guarantee is we're not going to be sitting in this press box at 11.03 p.m. Oh, with stories still to write. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's what I'm excited about. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right. Seriously, appreciate all you guys showing up. We're up over 500 for a lot of this show. Um, so, while you're here, hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, we'll put the podcast up, share share us on social media if you can. Appreciate that. Obviously, thanks, Gerard, for, for telling us what was going to happen before it happened. You just save, just save me some time, man. I don't even got to show up. Just tell me what's going to happen. I appreciate it. Thanks to Alex doing everything behind the scenes. Thanks to our friends at Yingling. Um, they, they are making a lot of what we're doing this year possible. The tailgate last week, the post-game show, they're sponsoring all our game day stuff. So, uh, look, it's still only 11.04. I know Auburn and Cal started at like 9.30. That game's probably not even at halftime yet. So you still got time. Grab yourself a couple more yinglings. Watch the game. 
we're gonna we got post game video coming. Connor McLean helped us out with that. We got uh, I've got a column in the works. Gerard will have a notebook. We'll have grades in the morning, snap counts, all that. We got all kinds of stuff, guys. So appreciate you hanging out with us. Uh, thanks again to all you guys, Gerard and Alex, and we will talk to you next time.